Hello everyone, and welcome to a free tutorial on black and white conversion. I'm George Jardine, and what I'd like to do here today is to take a bit of a detour from the regular tutorials and just talk about color and about black and white conversion. So I would not exactly call this a tutorial, really, as much as it will be just an exploration, which should be fun. So first, we're just going to go and do a very quick review of some of the basic black and white conversion techniques that you might have used in the past in Photoshop, because I think this will help set the stage for your understanding and appreciation of black and white conversion in general, and just how we ended up where we did with the latest crop of black and white controls for raw processing in Lightroom and Camera Raw. So here in Photoshop, we have four RGB files that are perfectly identical. All four were rendered from the same raw file using exactly the same settings. First up, we'll look at the default Photoshop conversion. And you get that by just going right up here and choosing Mode Grayscale from the Image menu. And then what you get is a perfectly acceptable black and white version for this particular photo. Boring, but acceptable. Next up, over here, I'll use a second method where I'll start by pulling up the hue and saturation dialog, this time from the image adjustments menu, like this, and then just dragging the saturation slider all the way to zero. Now, while this is still an RGB document, the image is now monochrome, meaning you have the very same data in each of the three channels, and equal amounts of R, G, and B in any given pixel makes gray, right? And it's probably worth noting here that using this technique will give you just exactly the same result as using the desaturate command that's on the same menu. So I'll cancel that real quick and then going back to image adjustments and then all the way down here to desaturate. They both do the same thing to your pixels. The desaturate command is just a shortcut to pulling the saturation all the way back in hue and saturation. And so looking at this, what you see right away is that the pure red colors in the sign are darker, and the yellow in here is way darker. And so while the overall contrast seems similar to our grayscale conversion over here, the actual color contrast is way different. And this is mostly where we're going to be headed with this today. As it turns out, good black and white conversions are all about creating good color contrast. But just roll with me for a minute here while we finish the overview. Next, down below that, you have the once very popular LAB, or the lab color method. So we'll go image, mode, and then lab color. And now it looks exactly the same as it did in RGB. But if I go over here and look at my channels palette, you'll see that we now have a lightness channel, an A channel, and a B channel. By converting to LAB, we've separated the lightness information from the color in the image. And when I click the lightness channel, Photoshop turns off the other channels and you have your grayscale. And then if I were to use this as my starting point, I would have a grayscale conversion that is a bit lighter and maybe just a bit flatter than these other two, right? To be honest, I don't know why this was such a popular technique and people still use it. Perhaps because black and white conversions usually look much better with lighter midtones like this. But no matter which technique you choose, you're always going to go in and finesse your black point, your white point, and your tone curve before you call it done, right? What we're doing here is just looking at some starting points, because it's these starting points that pretty much determine your color contrast, which you really can't change very much later. Overall contrast? Yes. Color contrast? No. So far, three different techniques and three different results. Now for our last conversion over here, we'll be looking at the channels palette again. Because again, this is where a lot of folks start with their black and white. So here's what the red channel looks like all by itself. It has lots of contrast, very dark blues up here in the sky, and relatively light reds here in the sign, right? So this is pretty punchy, and when you compare it to these others, it makes them look downright flat, doesn't it? If you wanted this look on black and white film, you'd have simply put a red filter on your lens. 
Then here's the green channel, which is sort of considered to be the one channel in RGB that most resembles the lightness values that your eye sees, very much like this first grayscale conversion up here. And then there's the blue channel, which is kind of otherworldly in a way. I mean, it makes the sky really light in tone, and it makes this red in the sign almost black, which isn't exactly what your eye expects. And again, that's because the color contrast is all out of whack. It just doesn't look real. And so each one of the three channels has its own contrast and tones, red, green, and then blue. What I'm going to do here first is I'm just going to pick one and do a conversion into grayscale. And looking at these, I'm going to pick red, because even though the red channel has this kind of funky noise up here in the sky, it'll do for this example. And so with the red channel selected, I'll go back up to mode and choose grayscale again. And yes, I do want to discard the other channels, so I'll click OK. Now we have just one or two more stops along the way before we're caught up to the 21st century. First, that would be the channel mixer. And since this straight desaturate version is the least interesting out of these four, at least to my eye, I'm going to revert this one and use it for the channel mixer. And I'm going to set that up over here as an adjustment layer on the Layers palette. Now, in the Color mode, which is the default, Channel Mixer more or less just gives you a way to create three new mixes that are then just pushed back into the individual R, G, and B channels, which has absolutely nothing to do with black and white conversion. So we're not going to cover that here. But the Channel Mixer does have this monochrome mode, which is mostly what people use it for. And so turning that on, we have a grayscale conversion that appears to be in the same general neighborhood as all these others. What you're doing here is basically creating a blend of the three color channels using a certain weighting of the grayscale information from each. For the defaults, that's 40% red, 40% green, and 20% blue. And if you remember when we looked at it, the red channel has the most contrast. And so if you wanted more contrast, and looking at this, you probably should, you could push up that influence, like this. Now, adding red not only increases the contrast in this case, but it also lightens the sign in here, and just about everything else in the photo that has any red in it. But unfortunately, pushing up the red throws the overall brightness out of whack. To compensate, you would then have to go in and pull down the green, or the blue, or start mucking around with the constant slider down here. Because if your total mix is not right around plus 100, then you'll be lightening or darkening the overall result. So pulling green down does get us back into that zone, but at the same time, it leaves us with a look that is really not any better than any of these others. And we're back to that nasty noise up in the sky again. And so it goes with the channel mixer. It just doesn't give me the type of control that I'm looking for. And so I'm going to delete that layer and take a quick look at one last option for grayscale here in Photoshop, and that's the black and white adjustment. Now with this method, we finally have all six primaries to work with, and these defaults. So let's just play around with the sliders and see what they do. OK, the reds. As I start to push the red slider back and forth, I think you can see right away that something very different is going on. With the black and white adjustment, you're able to affect just the colors in the picture that are predominantly red, without affecting any other color or the overall brightness, which is cool. And then the yellows, which controls a different thing. And the greens, which controls yet another thing. And so playing around with these, the thing that emerges is that this arrangement of controls starts to give you very precise control over the color contrast of your rendering. And that starts to go to the heart of what good black and white conversion is all about. It's that color contrast. And the color contrast is determined by how bright the various colors are represented in black and white. Here's an example. I'm going to open up this shot of a model on a blue background. And when that pops open in Camera Raw, I think most people will look at this and just instinctively tell you that her skin is lighter than the background, right? And it may be. I'm just going to surf over here to the HSL tab and click the grayscale button. And, hmm, OK, using the auto mode, Camera Raw is giving us a skin tone that is actually darker than the background. 
Now this auto mix is generated by the colors in the image, so it will be slightly different for every photo. In general, it tries to create as much color contrast as it possibly can, which in this case is not that great because we have certain expectations about how bright that skin tone is going to be relative to the blue background, right? So then look what happens when I click the default button. Aha! This gives us a straight line down through here with all the values set to zero. And this rendering is giving us a skin tone that is lighter than the background. Take a look at it again. I'm going to go back. This is auto. And then this is with the so-called default mix. And with default, we're actually getting more contrast. Maybe not what the designers intended for this particular photo. Now, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if everyone saw color the same way. And by now, you can see that each formula for black and white conversion is slightly different too, giving you different brightness values for each color. And so that's what we want to explore next. Just where do these brightness values come from? To look at that, I'm going to cancel out of Camera Raw, and then let's go up here and open up a handy little file that I have, and let's take a look at what happens when you start to work with just pure colors. And just so you know what we're looking at, I'm going to click the Gradient tool here and show you how the spectrum of colors was created. If I click right up here, it opens the Gradient Editor, and you can see each of the six colors that were used to make this gradient. Basically, it makes a blend between each of the six primary colors. If you double-click each one of these, you'll see that each of these colors was indeed specified at 100% saturation. And so, canceling out of that, what do you think will happen if I go back to my hue and saturation dialog, just like we did on the Oakville Grocery a minute ago, and pull out all of the saturation? Okay, it's all just gray. And this shows you why this particular technique is hardly ever used anymore, because it almost always makes a very flat conversion. The reason for this is because the hue and saturation control works in an HSL model. And in that model, colors that are 100% saturated are not at 100% brightness, like they are in the HSB model. These two models for specifying and manipulating color are just that. They are models. So when I show you these, don't confuse this cylindrical shape with the actual shape of the color space. This is just a mathematical model that gives us a very neat and clean way to specify colors and to push them around. Looking at the HSL model, you'll see that the most saturated colors are represented around the middle of the cylinder, halfway between the top and the bottom, which puts them at exactly half of their possible lightness. And so pulling the saturation out of them in this model just moves them all toward the center of the cylinder, which makes them gray. But guess what? This is not the way your eyes see lightness at all. So I'm going to cancel that. And let's take a look at the color again. Just looking across these colors, it's really obvious to your eye that some of them appear lighter and some of them are darker, even though in HSL they all have the same lightness. Okay, let's try another type of conversion. But before I do that, I'm just going to go up here and duplicate this whole document so that we can have a color version up here for comparison. And then arranging those just a little bit, I'll go back up to the Mode menu, and this time I'm going to choose Lab Mode. Once it's converted, I'll go back to my Channels palette and click the Lightness channel again. Now, this is a lot more interesting because this really starts to show me what's going on with the conversion. So what I get now is this large area, all in through here, that is lighter. From the pure cyans over here, all the way through the green colors to the yellows over here. And if you look carefully, you'll see that pure yellow and pure cyan over here are the lightest. And then in through here, the blues get darker. And then right in here, you have another very narrow band of a slightly lighter tone. And that's where pure magenta was the color that you get when you mix pure blue with pure red. And so again, the question is, where do the lightness values come from? In this case, the values are coming straight from the LAB data, from the L channel. And it's these lightness values that create your starting point for your basic color contrast, at least in these conversions. And so they're probably worth exploring just a little bit. One very good way to look at where these lightness values come from 
is to look at them in ColorThink. What we have here is a plot of the sRGB color space in an LAB coordinate system. For those of you who have never considered what lab color is all about, this might help you conceptualize it. You see the lightness axis goes up and down from top to bottom, and that's labeled L. Then you have the A and the B axis labeled down here. Lab is called a color opponent space because, as you can see, on the A axis you have these greenish cyan colors mapped against their opposites, the magenta colors over here. And on the B axis you have the yellow colors mapped against the blues from here to here. As colors become more pure or more colorful in this space, they move farther from the center out on these two axes. And on the L axis, you have the darkest colors down here at the bottom and the lightest colors up at the top. And so one of the cool things that you can do here in ColorThink is that you can not only look at the shape of a color space as it might be plotted in LAB, but you can also import an RGB file and see just exactly where the colors in that file are plotted. So let's do that. First, I'm just going to turn off this sRGB space. We'll look at that again in a minute. And then I'll just pop out this little menu and choose Open. And I'm going to point it at that same Spectrum file that we have open over here in Photoshop. And this takes just a minute for it to plot. And once it's done, you get this nice strand of colored pixels going around in the space, which is very cool. And so plotted in this space, you can clearly see how some of the colors in the spectrum are higher on the L scale and some of them are lower, which means these yellows and these greens and these cyans are the brightest that we had in the original spectrum, just like we saw in the grayscale conversion. And the blues over here are the lowest, which means they have a lower lightness value in this space. And then remember, we said earlier that these colors were as saturated as they could be in sRGB, right? Let's turn that back on, and you can now see exactly where those colors fall in sRGB. They are indeed running around the exact boundary of the sRGB space, where the colors are at their most, let's say, colorful, out here around the edge of the space. Any colors that are slightly lighter or darker than the colors that were in the spectrum file would be less colorful in this space. And they would be inside this line, like these reds in here, or these darker blues down in here. Out of all these very saturated colors, the pure blues are clearly the lowest in the L dimension down here. Pretty much everything goes up from there. And being able to visualize where this rim of those very saturated colors is in LAB shows you exactly where the lightness values come from when you just take the lightness information and discard the color. So anyway, all of that is just one more way to put a face on the math to make it visual. As it turns out, the lightness value that any specific color has in LAB comes from the way your eyeballs actually work. It's based on how sensitive we are to the various colors in the spectrum. Our eyes are very sensitive to yellows and greens, and less so to reds and blues. So what does that mean for our conversions back here in Photoshop? Well, all of that has just been a way to lay the groundwork for where we really wanted to go with black and white conversion, where we've always wanted to go. And that is to the place where you actually have very direct control over the specific lightness values that you want to create for the individual colors in your photograph. And that's what we now have in Camera Raw and in Lightroom. And so now that we have that background, let's take a look at a few examples of how much easier this process has become. And so in my mind, creating strong black and white conversions is all about two things. First and foremost, it's all about having good contrast. And in general, a good black point, a good white point, and good contrast are going to be very important. Second is color contrast, and that's most of what we're going to be talking about from here on out. How to create strong color contrast that helps your eye see the same relationships that it would if the color was there, or maybe better. That part is up to you. And so here's a selection of random color photographs. 
None of them make very special black and white conversions on their own, but rather these photos were chosen because each one of them illustrates a point. Go figure. Okay, starting with the Baja Grill. The very first thing I will always do when I'm toying with a potential candidate for black and white is to try the default conversion against the auto mix. And in both Lightroom and Camera Raw, depending on how you have your preferences set up, when you click to go into grayscale mode, you'll get one or the other. And because I've got the auto thing turned off in my preferences, when I click black and white right up here on the panel header, I'm getting what they call the default mix which is all just zeros. And if you care just what all the zeros really mean, it might help you to take a look back over here for a minute at our spectrum file. If I surf over to that and then click to convert it to black and white, you do indeed get lightness values that are very much like what we got with the LAB conversion over in Photoshop. Remember? This one is perhaps just a bit lighter along in here in the blues. And if you wanted to see exactly how these color ranges work, you can do this at home. Just pulling the blues down a tiny bit and right in about here you have something that's going to be very much like what you would get in the lightness channel of an LAB conversion. But that's neither here nor there because we're done talking about the numbers. What's important now is to learn how the controls work and then take that and learn how to trust your eyes to make good conversions just like in all my other tutorials. So back to the Baja Grill and our default conversion with all zeros. And then clicking to compare that with the auto mode, and well, I guess that's a little better, but I think we can do better. And so, starting with the reds. This is going to be the fire hydrant and some of the lettering in here in the sign. Going up and down, to be honest, I kind of like what I'm getting here, just a little bit brighter than the auto mix gave me, but pushing this back and forth, I guess I'm kind of on the fence about the reds. So for now, I'm going to leave them at zero. Next comes orange. Pushing this up starts to bring a lot of life into the sign and into the door, and that's good. I'm liking this going higher on the oranges. Up here around 35 or 40 or so is starting to look pretty nice. Okay, next, the yellows. Pushing this up and down, I see right away that going up doesn't help our contrast any and coming down, down here around minus 35 or 40 or so, brings the tree and the sign into play, and we need to see that. And also, it's giving us a little tone in here in the menus too, which helps. Okay, greens. The greens are in the plants and in the menus again, and I think bringing those down helps us too. Down here around minus 45 or so looks good to me. Okay, the aquas. This color pretty squarely hits the front of the building, and here's the interesting thing. I could take this up, like this, or I could take it down. I sort of like both, and I know there's some other colors in here that we're going to play with, so as long as I'm undecided about the building, I'm just going to leave that alone for now, too. So I'm going to come back to the aquas. And then look at the blues. Pushing that back and forth, and you'll remember that all these parts in the doors in here are pretty blue. And if I go back to the color for a second, you can see that this really saturated blue in here gives us a really nice color contrast in the color version. And then hitting undo, and with the blues at zero, they lose a lot of that impact, which is a lot of what this photo is all about, and they just become dark. And so I think lightening these up somewhere up here around plus 50 or so, brings a lot of that contrast back. And so now this move on the blues shows me that the front of the building can actually be darker. The aquas, remember? And so that answered that question. Taking the aquas down to about minus 80 or so keeps things from looking too washed out now. And then purple. Pushing the purples up and down shows me that the blue in these doors, as this blue goes up into the shadow, it actually becomes purple. And so we can afford a pretty strong move on that, I think, and pushing it up, I guess, all the way to 100. Doesn't hurt things a bit. And then finally, the magentas. Pushing this around, you can see that the only magentas in the photo are in the sign. They're not a huge part of this picture, but as it turns out, they're really important to the overall look. And so taking these all the way down here 
helps give us some of that contrast that we need. And so that's pretty much where I'm going to leave it. OK, are we done? When you get to the bottom and you think you're done, you've still got a couple of things to check. First, now that we like where we are, sometimes it makes sense to go back and double check a few things. For instance, these reds. When we started down this path, we didn't know what to do with the reds in this photo. But now that we've moved things all around, let's take another look. And hmm, pushing the reds back and forth, I can now see that moving the fire hydrant up just a bit and the bottoms of these letters here in the sign actually does make things better. Up here, not too much, but up here around plus 20 or so makes a difference. Sometimes it pays to just go back and pick up any of these color ranges that you weren't sure of earlier. And then when you think you're really done, I also think it's good to give yourself a sanity check just to see if you've really screwed anything up. And I do that by going back and checking my finished look against the defaults again. And so holding down the Option key and clicking to load the defaults again, this is the default conversion. And no, that's not very interesting. It just doesn't have any intrigue at all compared to this when I undo. And then clicking Auto again just to check this out. So this is before with the Auto Mix, and then this is after with my conversion. And I think that's pretty good. I really do think we've taken this photo in a completely new direction. This is a look that you never could have even come close to using any other tool. In this photo, we're using all eight ranges. And to my eye, it's got a lot of vibrance to it. Clicking Auto again, this is before, and then this is after. So that's a major improvement. But again, are we done? Well, remember back at the beginning of this tutorial, I said that good black and white conversions are about having a good black point, a good white point, and good contrast, all of which we seem to have here. But at the same time, when I think about what this photo might have looked like if I had shot it on film and printed it in a real dark room, I see something else. We've got pretty good contrast here, but at the same time, it does still have that kind of weird flatness in the midtones that is the dead giveaway that it was shot on digital. And sometimes when you see that, the first thing you should do is to surf up here to the basic panel and take a look at your clarity setting. Because more often than not, a shot like this can use a little clarity. And sure enough, pushing that up starts to reveal that up here around plus 40 or 50 really seems to bring it all together. OK, so that's my conversion for this photo. And I'm going to call it good and move on to the flower. So what we have here is a pretty punchy studio shot that seems to have plenty of color contrast, right? Pressing the V key to take it over into black and white. And well, this is actually pretty amazing. It's not bad. I mean, normally when you have very saturated reds like this, they seem to go kind of flat in the first stage of black and white conversion. I think we can do better, but this actually isn't a bad starting point. And then clicking Auto just to see what that does. And well, that lightened the reds and sort of reduced our contrast a bit, neither of which really helps us here. So again, which starting point to use? It's a toss up, but I'm going to start with the default mix, starting at the top. Pushing the red slider back and forth and you pretty much get what you expect. I mean, the whole flower at first seems to be pure red. And the control is pretty touchy on this particular photo. Small moves here are giving me pretty dramatic changes. I just can't push this red up or down very much without wrecking things. But take a look at this. If I leave the reds at zero and go down here and push the oranges around a little, you see that the color of the flower is also being affected by this zone. And that's actually a bit unexpected for me. But going back and looking at the color, it sort of turns out to be a huge bonus. Take a look at this. The colors in the flower that are falling into the orange zone are these lighter parts of the flower, up along in here, along the tops of the petals, and in here. And the darker parts of the flower happen to be moving more into the red colors in this particular photo. And the cool thing about this is that it just happens to give us a very unique opportunity to really bring out some nice contrast in the photo by taking advantage of that. Going back to my black and white and then pushing down the reds again, 
pretty quickly turns the whole flower black. But then leaving that there, obviously too dark, and pushing the oranges up and up and up, and wow, this is pretty cool. Pushing the oranges up just seems to make things better and better in terms of contrast. So this is good. And it seems like I can just take it all the way to 100. And then coming back to my reds, pulling those down gently brings my contrast back down here around minus 35 or so. And I'm really liking that. When I first looked at this photo, I was thinking, no way would it make an interesting black and white. And so this is where it's sometimes very difficult to tell. Sometimes you just have to go in here and fiddle around to see what's in the photo. Sometimes there's a great black and white hiding in the least likely places. Okay, what's next? The yellows. Pushing the yellows up and down, and this time the yellows is a much more subtle effect. Much less influence than the oranges had, which is a bit of a surprise. The yellows is just moving things up and down a bit in here. And so pushing that up just a bit seems to help things, up around plus 25 or so. And then even though you thought the stem of the flower was green, it's not. It's mostly yellow. And so the greens, the aquas, the blues, all the way down here into the purples, guess what? No colors in this photo that can be tweaked in these zones. So I'm going to leave them all at zero. And finally, magenta. And this is actually a very good lesson. No matter what colors you think are in your photo, you've got to go down through the sliders and play with each one because there will always be a surprise. And here it is. The magenta in this photo is just in the stamen, just in the very tip right up here. And what we have here is a pretty pure magenta color, and so we can control it very precisely. And so to give this black and white conversion the finishing touch, I'm just going to lighten up the tip of the stamen up here around 55 or so. And that's it. Okay, next example. A really intense color shot. Should I convert this photo to black and white? Well, let's try the default conversion. And sort of predictable by now that the default conversion would not be all that interesting. And then what about the auto mix? Clicking that, and well, a tiny bit better, but still, nothing compared to the color. But rather than bore you with my mental process on each and every slider this time, because I think you get that by now, I'm just going to roll over here and load my finished black and white snapshot. And so this is where I took it. And you can see by looking at the sliders that you have some pretty interesting moves going on over here. And curiously, this time, it's the blues that are the only color that I needed to make darker here. If I push that up for a minute, you'll see why right away. A good portion of this reflected light along the bottom of these shelves and a lot of the colors up here in the right part of the photo are blues. And with the blues anywhere to the right of zero, the whole photo goes flat. Pulling them down over here brings the drama back. Going back to the color, and you'll remember that it was the blue colors against these yellows and greens that gives this photo great color contrast and that can just make it in black and white. And then going back to the default conversion, look at how flat this becomes. A lot of this flatness is because of how light the blues are being rendered. Your eye just expects them to be darker in this case. And so, in my mind, that's really the lesson in black and white conversion. There's never going to be a fixed relationship between any given color and one lightness value. Every photograph will be different. And having eight zones of influence gives you a tremendous amount of control. All you have to do is push them around and learn to trust your eyes. Forget what the positions of the sliders are and just make it look good. Last but not least, let's take a look at the most obvious example of all. A very monochromatic photo. Will this make a good black and white? Who knows? All you can do is try it. Clicking to convert it using the defaults, and well, not bad. And then trying auto, and well, not much better, but still not horrible. And then going in and pushing things around a bit just to see where the values fall. And of course, it shouldn't be any surprise that almost every tone in this photo is either orange or yellow. The only difference here is that the yellows seem to be falling more in the highlights, and so pushing that up over here gives us better contrast. But really, in this case, all this photo really needs is a bit of a tweak up here on the tone curve.
pushing the darks up to about 40 or 50 here and then crushing down the shadows to about minus 40 really starts to give me the contrast that I expect from this photo in black and white. Learning how to use the tone curve for me is important in almost every correction, color or black and white. I didn't show you this before, but take a look at all the photos we've been working with. Every single one of them has a move on the tone curve, one by one, all the way down the row. These curves are all part of the basic color correction for each photo, and that curve will almost always apply to how the photo will look in black and white. And so if you want to master the tone curve, it only takes 30 minutes here on Mulita.com with my Adobe Camera Raw tutorials. So that might be worth checking out. And then finally, we have this last shot of the workers in Rangoon pulling the cart. And before I show this to you, I'm just going to close up the entire right-hand panel because I'm not going to reveal the secrets of this conversion to you yet. So here's the raw scan of the Kodachrome slide that was shot almost 30 years ago. And then here's where I took it with my grayscale conversion and a few other tweaks. If you want to see the entire step-by-step -step process that I went through to optimize this scan, then you'll just have to sign up for my next series on Lightroom and Photoshop integration that will be out right here on Melita.com just in time for summer. And so that's it. Thanks for watching, folks. And so now get out there and make some great black and whites.